Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. From First Paw Media, sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company, this is the Dog Driver Show. Visit our website at dogworksradio.com. Now here are your hosts, Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and I'm here with my co-host Kurosh Parto and we are the Dog Driver Show. And today we have a mutual friend and fellow board member of the Chugiak Dog Mushers Association. He was just elected president last month. And this is a very interesting show for us, KP. This marks our two-year anniversary. I cannot believe we've been doing this for two years together. That's crazy, actually. That's a long time, believe it or not. Over uh, 100 and, uh, what, 104 uh, okay. interviews, I guess. That's awesome. Yeah, today we have Scott Maruski, a good friend of mine, um, uh, my neighbor, a uh, close action neighbor, uh, who's been in the sled dog sport for many, many years, and uh, the current president of CDMA, the Chugak Dog Marchers. We are uh, honored to have him uh, as a president and also as part of our show. Scott, welcome to uh, the show, and tell us a little bit about you, your kids, and what you do with your dogs. Yeah, hey guys, uh, thanks for having me. Um, once again, it's uh, Scott Maruski, I'm current president of the Chugiak Dog Mushers Association and former president, former vice president of the Alaskan Sled Dog Racing Association in Anchorage. And we got into mushing um, through my kids. The pastor of our church was a dog musher, and he started pulling kids from the congregation and and uh, had them uh, go run the one dog. And so my kids got in and liked it and got up to two dogs and three dogs. And eventually we couldn't borrow enough dogs to keep them racing and we said well we want to get our own dogs we better do it now and so when 2009 we bought our first uh five sled dogs that we had or we bought yeah we bought four and we already had one and uh that's how we got started in it and my kids and i have been heavily involved in it ever since then so and uh, Scott, uh, I, as I know, you put uh, the top teams and uh, the top events in the uh, in the kids' hands. Uh, how difficult is it? Is it actually any difficult at all to uh, train these dogs and uh, take care of them and hand them over to the kids to uh, to go and race them and enjoy them? No, I mean I, I enjoy working with the dogs. I enjoy training more than I enjoy racing, really, because you get a work with the dogs more is when you're racing you're just going out and i gotta go out and win or i gotta go out and have my best run and you don't get a lot of time to work with the dogs that much so you know as far as the training it for the kids it's what i've always done we got into it because of them and the you know a lot of my pleasure comes in the training and and then watching the kids be successful in their runs so as my kids got older i have two kids that are adults now and They've been racing the dogs for the last couple of years in adult races, just taking turns back and forth and between the eight dog team, four dog team, six dog team, whatever we have out there. And and then my, I still have one junior that races and um, it's, it's what I really enjoy is watching the kids go out there and have successful runs and have a good time doing it. How do you organize uh, the races? Uh, who runs what and uh, who picks what dog? Well, if there's a junior race going on, um, because and my older kids understand this too, we've always let the junior racer run the dogs that they want to run. And then whatever's left over is the team that gets put together for an adult race if they happen to be the same day. Most of the time they're on different days. So the junior racer, Mia, my youngest, she 
this year she finally decided she wanted to go fast. We started her out with some good steady dogs that were a little bit older. And then as she kept going, she goes, I want to go faster. I want to go faster. So by the end of the year, she was probably around the top four dogs in our team in the five dog class. And she ended up winning the junior world championship with that. As for the other races, um, because the dogs in my kennel range from the ages of, I had a bunch of, had four yearlings this year, all the way up to an eight year old. And as we all know, in this limited class sprint racing, as they get to the seven and eight year range, they lose that mile an hour or so. And they were bigger dogs, so they only like to go the lower distances. So um, half the team in our eight dog team was the yearlings plus a two year old, a three year old and a four year old. And then, and then two six year olds that got mixed in there back and forth. So it was just a matter of we always tried to put the best dogs we could to fit the distance of the race, and it just so happened we were always shooting for the eight dog team, and we had a good good eight dog team this year. And then when the kids race, my two older ones in the adult races, um, a lot of times it has to do with their work schedules. My son raced a lot of the two day races because he didn't work Saturday and Sunday. And if it was a one-day race, my daughter ran on Sunday because she didn't work on Sundays. So it's it's a lot of sharing going on, but that's that's how we got into it, and that's why we stay in it. So, Scott, uh, is it sometimes frustrating because you have a very competitive eight-dog team, and is it frustrating to have to sometimes split that? And you know that you got a fast dog team, and but instead of eight, you only have five because the other three are running in the other class. How hard is well, that? Most- most of the time, like we said, we try to set up the eight dog team to be the best dog dogs on the team. You know, sometimes you have an injury or something like that. Like we had one injury this year that put the dog out for the season and we had to bring another dog up that was running in the six dog class. So, but we always try because of our kennel, we always were striving to get a very competitive eight dog team. So that's where we always tried to put the best dogs whenever possible. How do you juggle between a professional life training? Uh, you know, I, I see you often at the track. Uh, you, me, myself, several other people, uh, you see those folks more often. How do you juggle between job, work, uh, with the dogs, kids, activities, and all of that? <laughs> well, I have a wife that's very supportive with the kids, too, and taking care of some of those activities. She's involved in the dog clubs, but doesn't isn't really involved in the dogs as far as training and everything goes and then but she helps out at the races too when she can when she's not volunteering the, with the club to do something trail guard or whatever it is but um you just have to make the time if you're if it's a passion and you want to do it you just make the time sometimes you're training at night sometimes you're you know not getting in all the training you want um just because of work gets in the way nice thing with my job is i you know, my busy season is from May through October, September. And so I can take time off in the afternoon to go home early so I can train in the daylight instead of training at seven o'clock at night. So it's a matter of juggling. And plus my job helps me adjust that too, because of the seasons. You are one of the typical kennels that I know of who started with the juniors and then continued, uh, the program. Um, how important is it, Scott, to have kids involved in the sports uh, for the growth of our sport overall? Oh, it's very important. Uh, you know, if if the juniors aren't involved, um, a lot of adults, you know, the, you'll have that space in there where a lot of adults are getting their college education or getting secure in their jobs, things like that. So there will be a six, eight, you know, year window if they were active as juniors and got out before they got back in. Or a lot of the adults that race, they don't get into it till their 30s and 40s when their life has settled down and it becomes a passion for them. Um, so keeping the juniors involved is very, very important uh, for the continuation of the sport. Um, because if you, you know, what what I we realized in Anchorage um, at the club there is we really pushed juniors. I remember when we first got into it, we had um, 50, 60 kids racing on some on some weekends so it was a great thing for us and as the winters got bad and we didn't have a lot of season uh, maybe one or two races max we saw that we started to lose kids and a lot of it has to do with they lose focus they decided they wanted to do something else whether it was play basketball or whether it was go skiing 
or do something with their other friends um, because there weren't dog races. They got off on something else. And so then we started losing juniors that way. And the other way too around here um, that we run into is just the difficulty of parents wanting to support the kids in it and keep, you know, six, eight dogs or whatever the requirements are for whatever races they're doing you know, in their yard or in their house or whatever the case may be. It's just more and more difficult as Anchorage becomes a big city. Tell me about your dogs. Uh, how many dogs you got and uh, where are they from? Well, when we first started in it, um, we had one dog from Rick Cavins. I bought three or I bought four from Brenda Berg. And then I bought two from Eddie Duke uh, were the first dogs I purchased. And then we gained one or two here. And then about seven years ago, we um, were approached by Lori and Ken Chizik about possibly whelping a litter for them. So we chose to, and we ended up splitting the litter with them. And then we did it again a couple of years later and a couple of years later. And uh, so pretty much all the dogs I'm racing right now are from their lines and and mixed in with uh, Karosha's lines as well, too, because they're all you know, intermixed kennel there. So... That's where most of my dogs come from, and I have two dogs uh, from Brenda that are still left, but they're 14 years old, so they aren't running anymore. They're just retired in the yard, and then I have two that I bought from Eddie Streeper. So majority of our kennel is from Ken and Lori and KP. And uh, how do you uh, prepare your dog team uh, for this season? Uh, I'm talking about... Uh your fall training and your uh, snow training, of course. Well, fall training, as most people hear, it starts on a four-wheeler or side-by-side or whatever it is you're using and a lot of, you know, short, mild runs on the trails that we can use and making lots of loops at Chugiak as the season goes along until we get snow and the trails freeze up. Um, but it's just, the, it starts usually September, and goes on until we can get on snow and get on the sleds. And um, one of the things we do too in the fall is because of the short training runs, we also have the dryland season, and and we got into the, that. My kids have done the bike during. I have a cart that I race the four dogs with, and now that my kids are old enough, I'm probably gonna uh, throw one of them on the cart if if they dare to. That's scary. Because <laughs> because it is a scary run. It is <laughs> you can't scary stop run. those dogs with that slight cart. <laughs> yeah, for uh, listeners who are not familiar with uh, some of his dogs, they are big boys, and uh, yeah, they are, it is scary to put some of those guys in front of a little uh, aluminum yeah. cart. Uh, tell us about your nutrition. Uh, how do you feed your dog team off season and on uh, during the season? Well, during the off season, I mainly just stick with kibble. And what I feed is uh, Dr. Tim's. Um, I became the distributor for Dr. Tim's uh, shortly after we got into mushing. And so I'm the distributor for the state of Alaska for it. So it's a uh, very good, high, high-end competitive dog food. Um, you know, you spend a little more money on it, but it's, it's a good food, good nutrition base, good, good digestibility for the dogs. And uh, that's what I do during the off season. And I feed it throughout the year. And then when wintertime comes along and we're doing heavier training, gets a little colder out, I add meat into it, mostly beef is what I add in, beef and fat in order to supplement the kibble and uh, let the help the dogs to perform better to get more calories into them. So that's the main thing of it, you know, and when you have, like, like KP was saying, I got some big boys. My biggest boy is 85 pounds, but you only know it when you're standing next to him because he's just tall and lean, but he's just a huge dog. That would be Otis. And then I have a couple other three, four that are, you know, in the 70 pound range, you know, 65. So um, takes a lot of food and takes a lot of juice to keep those big boys going. But it, it works well because, as I said, you know, Otis is in our eight dog team. So he's a 10, 12 mile dog. And that's speaking well of him for, uh, since he's a 85 pound dog. So I think half of that, you know, a lot of that's contributed to the training you put into them, and a lot of it's contributed to the nutrition that you feed the dogs to keep them going. That is that is definitely true. Uh, you are one of the few people uh, who uh, jumped in the uh, dryland sport uh, very quickly in Alaska. I know that a lot of us, we are just kind of on the sideline supporting the events, of course, but not racing. But you actually got into racing pretty much right away. Uh, why do you think dryland sport is 
important uh, for our sport as a whole? It gets more people involved is what it does. It gets more people exposed to the dog mushing. I've, I've brought workers, uh, co-workers have came out and they're very competitive bike riders and hooked up dogs in front of them. And because of their comp- competitive drive with dog ra- with bike racing, you hook a dog in front of them and they were very competitive and were actually won a couple of races out in the dry land. So that's the important thing with the dry land, you know, is if you have one dog or two dogs, you can get out there and you can bike your, or you can scooter, or you can do the can across, you know, the people that do the cart racing um, generally are the ones that are running the four, six, eight dog classes in, on the snow in the wintertime on sleds. But a lot of the other classes are people that just come out to do it because it's a fun way to be active with your dogs. And you can actually even train more when you're running one or two dogs with a bike because you can do it on other trails and things like that. So I think that's the most important thing with the dryland racing is other than keeping the something for the sled racers to do, it brings more and new people exposed to the sports. Now I'm going to change the subject completely. During the last 10 years or so, Scott, you've been heavily involved in different boards uh, for different clubs in Alaska and your family also They've been involved, Brooke, uh, you know, with the kids, Zeta with the kids. Uh, how important it is to volunteer your time and your efforts and your energy for organizing events like Rendezvous, which you do every year, or running a club for all the members? It, if people didn't volunteer, if people didn't want to be on the board, these clubs would go away. I mean, it takes people to make these races go on, whether it's, uh, you know, a junior race out in Chugiak or the for rendezvous race, you need volunteers. And part of the thing with being on the, on the board, um, when I first started with the Azure club, I was just volunteering as a trail guard. And then after a couple of years of doing that, they asked if I wanted to be on the board. So I was, and a couple of years later, I was the vice president and, you know, with the board, a lot of stuff, um, you want to focus on getting volunteers to help with the races and to help with trail maintenance and things like that, or you can focus your time on making the club a better club, finding sponsors. Uh, sponsorship for races is a big thing because the more money you can offer for, um, you know, making improvements to the trails, making improvements to the clubhouses and offering prize money for the races. Um, the better chance you have of getting more people to come to the races and enjoy your facilities. Whereas the, if you don't put that effort forth, you know, the races are going to go away. People don't want to travel for it because it's expensive to keep all these dogs and to travel with them. So unless you can put on a very worthy event that makes them proud to come and say that they raced it, um, it's, they're going to go away. So it's very important being a volunteer and making sure these clubs still strive and or thrive into the future. It is so true, Scott. It is so true. A lot of uh, uh, you know uh, our listeners, if they're not familiar with this, uh, to organize an event, uh, it takes hundreds of hours of effort uh, by all the volunteers to put it together. Any race. Uh, and uh, we should be always thankful of uh, all the people putting all their times and energy uh, into uh, organizing those events or the clubs. Yeah, one of one of the real nice things, like I've I've done for Rendezvous for oh, ten years now, and for the last probably eight, I've been running the lead snow machine and helping set up the trails. And the for Rendezvous is anyone that's ran it or anyone that's watched it know it's like no other dog race here. Um, going through the cities, going through the parks, um, even going through where our where Azra's normal trail system is is there are literally hundreds of trail crossings and street crossings and bridges and culverts. And there are so many places that you can have interactions with people, whether they're there to watch or whether they're out there riding their fat tire bikes or skiing or whatever it is. So just getting the volunteers there to help during those races and other races to help watch at those crossings, to warn people that there's a dog team coming because people don't hear dog teams coming and it, it's so important during rendezvous we'll have well over 100 volunteers and thousands of volunteer hours into putting just that one race on because of the complexity of the system that it goes through 
Scott, I want to circle back a little bit and talk a little bit more about juniors in our last few minutes. Uh, you had talked about at the top of the show about you having um, three of your kids involved in the sport uh, in juniors and then on into adults. But you had also mentioned, I believe you said at one time there was about 60 kids at at uh, at one of these races that that uh, that you were involved in we don't see that anymore and you had mentioned that there's so many things that pull kids away now uh from from back in the day you know whether it be other sports or social media or hanging out with friends or whatever you know do you see an, an alarm at all going into the future with sort of the future of the sport because there just aren't those kids anymore you know most of the time, especially as we work into the distance races, it, it's the same families. It's the CVs and the and the boosters and the you know those types of folks that everybody knows. But the the you know the smaller families they just aren't involved anymore. Is that an alarm to you? And if so, how do we fix it? Well, I'll answer the second question first. I don't know how to fix it. Um, it's it's a very complex thing, and, and a lot of it has to do with, like, you know, all the things you mentioned, but, um, you know, just maintaining a dog kennel has become very, very expensive. Yep. You know, it's the expense that people need to pay for the food and the vet bills and the kennel licensing and, um, you know, just, you know, building the facilities proper for where you live to keep the dogs so you're not upsetting your neighbors and things like that. You know, it's um, it's a very it's a very difficult thing to keep a dog team around. And, you know, for distance people, I don't see how they do it. Open class people, when they, you know, have 20, 30, 40 dogs, you can't have that in the city, middle of Anchorage or it's even difficult in Chugiak now with how populated these areas are becoming. And so, and that's been part of the issue and it is raising some alarms, you know, it's just difficult in these areas to keep things going. You know, Fairbanks things seems to be striving. Um, you know, the Willow area is actually, you know, lots of dog mushers out there. Um, but a lot of it, you know, Fairbanks, North Pole, that area, there's a lot of sprint racers up there because it's still more of the Alaska environment and people have more dogs and it's, it's, more along that line it's just you know that's for dry line coming in and you know people with able to have smaller kennels and have you know four or five six dogs and do their dry land races and then maybe ski or or do a four dog race in the winter time you know that's something that's more reachable for most people that are interested in the dogs um you know, the alarming part is, is on the bigger teams, the open class teams, things like that. It just seems like there's fewer and fewer of those in Alaska, especially South Central Alaska, than there ever used to be. You know, so as how to fix it, it's it's a difficult thing um, with, with the way society is changing, with the way the, um, you know, the demographics of Anchorage and South Central are changing. It, it's just... It, it's difficult to get that many people involved in it anymore. And, yeah. I, and I haven't figured out a way to get do it, to fix it. And, and you know, that, that's a job that, uh, that we often uh, are challenged with as, as board members of these clubs on how to get interest, not only with racers, but also volunteers that you talked about as well. Last question, Scott, before we go, here's the question we ask all of our guests, and that is somebody is just getting involved, as we mentioned in that first question there, um, and they're looking to you for one piece of advice. What would you tell them? Stick within your means. You know, don't jump into it and try to get an eight, ten dog team put together right away. Or if you know we want to do you know distance racing, try to get sixteen dogs, twenty dogs put together. Stick within your means and grow slowly. You know, if it's doing two dogs and you're doing ski during with them, or all of a sudden you have um, you want to do a sled race and you have four dogs, but don't jump in full bore right away and think that you're going to succeed because you're not. You're just going to have more headaches than you will pleasure out of it. And that's why we did is we started borrowing dogs and then started with four and then went to six and went to eight and worked our way up. And it's just, it's just the best way to do it. You know, it, there's not, 
you're not going to get an instant answer and people will say well you know these guys offered me four dogs i can have them for free well that's <laughs> they're getting rid of those dogs for a reason and giving them away yep. um so so it's just don't take everything everybody offers um you know a lot of times just take your time and get into it slowly good advice you know a lot of people have dogs to borrow uh you know there's they have too many dogs for whatever race they're doing and they would love to have there are other dogs involved with racing as well. Scott, thank you very much. KP, anything else in closing? No, Scott, thank you uh, again for the show, and thank you for everything you do for the club uh, and for the, our sport. And uh, good luck with the rest of the season, uh, summer, I guess. And uh, we'll, talk to you. we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. On behalf of our guest today and my co-host, KP, this is Robert for the Dog Driver Show. Be sure to check us out on social media by searching dogworksradio.com and be sure to hit that subscribe button and get ready for our third year of uh of podcasts here on the dog driver show talk to you guys next time goodbye this episode of the podcast is sponsored by first paw coffee company learn more at firstpaw.coffee from first paw media this is the dog driver show We hope you enjoyed this podcast and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art and you can see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe too. Your hosts are Robert Forto and Kurosh Parto. Our producer is Robert Forto and created for First Paw Media. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forto and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.